Good evening, everyone. I would like to start the start. Is it audible? Hello. Yes, it's audible. Yes. 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 Oh, it's audible. Good evening, everyone. I would like to start this talk of the month event with a quote. The ideal engineer is a composite. He is not a scientist. He is not a mathematician. He is not a sociologist or a writer. But he may use the knowledge and technique of any or all these disciplines in solving engineers' problem. I am Jeffrey Ambrose D, treasurer on behalf of Students Council. I welcome your our chief guest, Dr. Dipin S. Pillai, Assistant Professor, Chemical Engineering, IIT Kanpur. Our Associate Dean, Dr. Purnasamy, and all our honorable faculties, alumni members, and all other future engineers present in this talk. A short note on IACHE talk of the month. IACHE students chapter, which also serves as a schema, initiated alumni G meet, where Sastra Chemical Engineering alumni could come and share their learning and experience both in out of university. Owing to the success of alumni G meet series as an another initiation under a different title, IACHE talk of the month is being mooted from this academic year as a part of chapter's activity. Every month we will be having a working professional, industrialist, academician to address the current and graduated alumni on their expertise. The topic can be core, semi-core, service, entrepreneurship, etc. Well, the objective behind having this talk is to enable learning as a continuous process. Thus, the IACHE students chapter provide a platform of learning not only when the student is in the campus, but serves to provide learning when graduates, thus enabling and powering the Sastra chemical alumni all along their career path, signaling the essence that learning is a lifelong process. Now I request our executive member, Ms. Aishwarya, to give a brief background talk about our chief guest. I request Aishwarya to take over. A very good evening to one and all present here. Uh, Dr. Dipin S. Pillai received his B honors in chemical engineering from Witspilani Goa campus in 2010. He obtained his PhD from the Department of Chemical Engineering, IIT Madras in December 2015, where he worked under the joint tutelage of Dr. S. Pushpavanam and Dr. T. Sundar Rajan, Department of Mechanical Engineering. His doctoral research was focused on interfacial instabilities associated with liquid jets. Thereafter, he worked as a postdoctoral fellow with Dr. Ranganarayanan in the Bifurcation and Nonlinear Instabilities Lab at the University of Florida. He joined the Department of Chemical Engineering at IIT Kanpur as an assistant professor in October 2019. His current research focuses on leveraging interfacial instabilities to enhance transport in microfluidic and microgravity settings. A prominent aspect of his research involves developing reduced order models for physicochemical transport phenomena. Thank you. Thanks, Aishwarya. At this point, I would welcome Dr. Rangamashyam of one of our faculty. Now, as a token of gratitude, we would like our assistant professor to give concern to show memento to our chief guest. Sir? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Uh... The memento will be displayed on screen. And the same will be courier to you, sir. Now, I request Dr. Dipin S. Pillai to deliver the talk of this month on the topic electrostatically forced resonant instability in thin liquid flames enhancing transport in microgravity and microfluidics once again i request all students to mute microphone please do not share your screen or turn on your camera if you have any queries please text in the text box thank you sir you can start your presentation thank you sir. Okay, so uh, let me begin. Uh, I hope I'm audible. Uh, 
Uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. You're yes, audible, sir. sir. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Jeffrey. Uh, thank you, Aishwarya. And uh, let me also express my gratitude to Dr. Narin for having uh, invited me to give this uh, IICHE student chapter talk of the month. And uh, I also thank all the students and uh, faculty and others, alumni, who have joined uh, this talk. So uh, let me start with the topic. Uh, so we, today I'm going to talk about some of the work uh, that I had done during my postdoctoral fellowship uh, at uh, University of Florida. The work was uh, sponsored by NASA and NSF. So uh, as you can see, the topic is on electrostatically forced uh, resident instabilities and how we can use them uh, to uh, enhance transport, uh, in specifically in microgravity and microfluidic conditions. So let me begin with a brief overview of the talk. So I'll start off uh, with some uh, introduction to stability and pattern formation. Uh, in general, why you see that certain uh, you know, uh, uh, solutions become unstable and they lead to patterns. Uh, we'll understand more of it as we go along, but these are some of the keywords that we'll keep hearing as uh, you go in this talk. Uh, once I introduce you to uh, how things become unstable and you know how patterns can form, I'll specifically look, look, look at the case of electrohydrodynamic instability. And uh, in electrohydrodynamic instability, I'll be talking uh, primarily about Faraday instability. Okay, uh, so these are again words uh, which will be introduced in more detail uh, down the line. Uh, then I'll introduce the mathematical model that I'll be using to understand uh, these uh, systems. Uh, the method that I'm using is known as the weighted residual integral boundary layer method. Uh, so one of the uh, expertise that I've gained uh, throughout my uh, uh, education is about uh, developing simple models uh, for uh, you know complex physics. So this is one of the means by which you can attain simple model uh, for certain kind of uh, systems where you have very thin films and you know where you have a uh, disparity in the length scales in the geometry. For example, if one dimension is much smaller than the other dimension, uh, so you can use certain approximations and uh, you can get simpler models than using a complete full scale CFD simulation. So uh, so that is something which I'll introduce. And then I'll talk about how, if you have a thin film, how you can uh, use electrostatic forcing, which means by applying an electric potential across the thin film, you can sort of uh, destabilize the thin film. Uh, you can make it resonate and uh, induce mixing and, you know, and uh, make uh, transport better. So uh, these were, uh, uh, so the, uh, the motivation for this was to use in space uh, applications where you have micro scale uh, electronics and uh, systems where you have very small dimensions. And in such cases, uh, the model that I'll be talking about, the weighted, weighted residual IBL model uh, is pretty much applicable and it gives satisfying results. Okay, so I'll uh, talk about that physics. Later on, I'll also uh, see how, if you have in terrestrial conditions, you have an unstable film, which is to say a heavy liquid uh, underneath a lighter liquid uh, by intuition we know that a heavy liquid should fall down uh, and we'll see whether we can stabilize or you know uh, uh, things like that using electrostatic field and uh, i'll be talking about a linear and nonlinear results and i'll explain what they mean as i go forward okay so let me start with the first part which is the introduction to stability and pattern formation so in nature you'll come across uh, several instances where you have uh, extreme nonlinearity uh, in the system Okay, by that I mean uh, you keep increasing certain parameters, uh, you'll see that the response is not linearly proportional. Uh, a simplest example is, uh, which I read is about, uh, you know, sweetness. So I like chocolates a lot, but you'll see that uh, if you eat one chocolate and you eat twice the amount and thrice the amount, you don't see that the taste, you know, the amount of liking that you get is not linearly proportional. After a while you saturate, you can't eat anymore. So that saturation is sort of non-linearity. So, there are several examples in nature where you'll see that there is some nonlinearity in between the uh, parameters and the response. And the uh, physical reason why such nonlinearity exists is because there are lots of competing forces. Okay, there are competing forces uh, which uh, do not act in a very simple linear fashion. Mathematically, they turn out to be nonlinear in their uh, uh, dependence with each other. Okay, so here are some examples. So on the left, on top, you're seeing uh, I think I can use the pointer. Yeah, so on the left, you are seeing uh, breaking up of a liquid jet into drops. 
Okay, so here the instability is called as the Rayleigh plateau instability, where a liquid cylinder uh, no more remains a cylinder, it eventually breaks into liquid drops. So when the fluid was starting off, it was a cylindrical liquid, and that cylindrical liquid can actually satisfy all the governing equations. It satisfies the mass conservation, it satisfies momentum conservation, it satisfies energy conservation. But still, even though that cylinder is a solution, it becomes unstable and it gives way to a more stable solution, which is a drop. So every time you open a tap, the cylinder, which is coming out as a fluid, eventually breaks into drops after some time, because by then, uh, after finite length, it becomes unstable and gives rise to new so uh, new solution, uh, which is also satisfying all the governing equations. So the drop is the solution which is more stable. So you have so that's what I mean by nonlinearity. Uh, nonlinearity essentially leads to multiple solutions, and in multiple solutions, only one of them can be stable, or multiple of them can be stable. But uh, under conditions, one of them gives way uh, to the other. Okay. And uh, on the right, on top, what you're seeing is a drying lake uh, bed example on a lab scale. So when you what you see is that the liquid uh, eventually keeps convecting because there is a temperature gradient inside the liquid. And as it convex, it convex uh, and forms these hexagonal uh, rolls. Okay, so this is also one form of uh, instability where a liquid can have a purely conductive profile where the temperature just conducts in a linear fashion, but uh, conduction gives way to convection. So that's also uh, instability wherein the convective heat transport uh, becomes unstable and gives to a convection wherein the fluid starts to convect around in the bulk. Okay, and that eventually leads when it dries up to the uh, lake bed looking like this. On the left bottom is uh, a heavy over light uh, fluid configuration. So the fluid which is heavy uh, eventually tries to come, come down because uh, uh, even though if you had a perfectly flat interface here, if you had a perfectly flat interface and you had a heavy liquid with a perfectly flat interface and a lighter liquid below, that is a mathematical solution which is satisfying all governing equations. You can have a pressure gradient, which is satisfied by the hydrostatic head, but that solution becomes unstable and it gives rise to a more stable solution, which is where the liquid at top wants to come down below and the liquid, which is lighter, goes up. Okay, so again, these are different forces competing. I'll talk about this specific example a bit more to give you more feel of the instability. And on the right uh, below is the Safman-Taylor instability, which happens when you have a less viscous fluid being pumped into a heavy, uh, into a more viscous uh, liquid. So the fluid that is getting pumped, the dye is less viscous. And what you have on the surrounding, the white uh, transparent liquid is more viscous. And you see that it doesn't go radially outward. The radially outward flow gives rise to what is known as fingers. And you can see that these uh, fingers keep developing, even though one solution is that you have a circular front which keeps propagating outward. That circular front, which is propagating outward, becomes unstable, and you see these patterns. Okay, so, so nature has all these uh, different forms where you can see patterns forming up. So this is a hexagonal pattern. These are called as dendritic patterns. And even Rayleigh-Taylor, you'll see that can give rise to something like this, where you have uh, well-defined patterns. And here, you'll see that the droplets are of specific radius that comes up, depending on the fluid viscosity, the density, and uh, even the flow rate at which it's being pumped. Okay, so. I hope uh, I hope this part is clear. So what I'll be uh, talking right now is about the mathematical framework with which you understand stability. Okay, so the most common example which is given to understand stability is this, where you have a hill and you have a ball sitting on top, and here you have a downhill where the ball is sitting at the bottom. And you have a very intuitive feel that uh, this is an unstable configuration, right? Because uh, if you were to disturb it by any small amount, the ball which is here, would eventually never come back to its position, right? And that is what I tried sh to show with my limited uh, animation skills. So you nudge it a bit, you'll see that the ball roll rolls down the hill and it never comes back to where it was. So this configuration of the ball sitting statically here, uh, when it was statically sitting here, satisfies all the governing equations, right? The, the, the mass of the ball was conserved, its momentum was zero and it is conserved because there was no force acting on it. Uh, the only force that was acting on it was the gravity downward and it was balanced by the normal reaction. So all uh, momentum conservation, mass conservation, energy conservation was valid here. But the point that being that uh, if you give a small disturbance, it doesn't come back to where it was. It goes very far away from that solution. 
Whereas in this case, you'll see that if you give a small nudge, uh, so this is very clearly unstable. So in this case, if you give a small nudge, uh, the ball would move a bit, but it would come back to its original position, right? So anything which comes back uh, to its original position when you disturb it is a stable configuration. But again, uh, uh, it is very conditional, right? Uh, for example, it depends on the kind of nudge you are giving. For example, you cannot say that this ball here is stable to all forms of nudges. For example, if you were to give a rocket launcher push to it, it would go to space, right? So it would never come back. So that tells you that stability is conditional. Right? It depends on the kind of disturbances that you're looking at. Okay, and uh, in our case, what we'll do is we'll any variable that you have, phi, we'll write it as phi bar plus phi tilde, which means phi bar is the original position or original configuration that it had. In this case, it's the position on top hill. Here it is at the position at bottom hill. And phi tilde is the disturbance that you're going to get. Okay, and linear stability analysis just means that I'm looking at small nudges. Okay, so you will keep hearing that I'll talk about linear stability analysis. So linear stability analysis means that I'm looking at some configuration of the system and I'm looking at very small disturbances. So disturbances are going to be infinitely small. So we are looking at small nudges, not at very large finite disturbances. So, and what I'll be also looking at is something known as modal analysis. Okay, so modal analysis just means that the form of disturbance that we can give in space will be taken as Fourier modes. So the X and Z dependence, for example, uh, or specifically X dependence in this case, I'll be looking at 1D problem. So I'll only have IKX, which means it's a Fourier mode. So the idea being that uh, when you have spatially extended systems, you can give any number of or infinitely, pos infinitely uh, different ways in which you can give spatial uh, uh, nudges, right? You can give a sinusoidal, disturbance in space, you can give uh, sort of a delta in space, a delta function, Dirac delta function, you can give a ramp, linear ramp, you can give parabolic in X and things like that. All of these functions can be looked as a Fourier decomposition. That is what this means. So, and we'll only look at how each Fourier mode is going to change in time, okay? And uh, you'll see that the omega t tells you, the, the value of omega specifically tells you whether things will increase or decrease in time. Okay, so we look at modal analysis means we look at each k, what happens to the uh, omega. So k is the wave number, like because Fourier modes are sines and cosines. We look at how different sines and cosines, what happens if you give sines and cosines, whether they grow or decay in time. So that is what modal analysis means. Okay, so effectively you'll end up getting curves like this, where you have wave number and you have growth rate. So for different wave numbers, if growth rates are positive, the system is unstable, and if uh, so there will be a critical cutoff wave number usually for which the system is stable. Uh, on the left hand side, it's unstable. On the right hand side, it's stable because the growth rate is positive and it's continuous function. It keeps going down and uh, everything on the right is having a negative growth rate, which means the system is stable, uh, which means if you give a sine wave of this wave number, it will be decaying. Whereas if you give a sine wave of this wave number, it will amplify, okay? And so these are the state range of unstable wave numbers. These are the range of wave wave stable wave numbers. And the maximum growth rate is of importance because that tells you the fastest growing wavelength, okay? And it is the fastest growing wavelength which usually decides the length scales that you see in the final uh, experiment that you do. For example, the spacing between these patterns that you see is effectively going to be governed by this maximum growing uh, wave number. Okay, so these are, these are just the basics. Uh, of uh, the talk and uh, the nonlinear simulations are going to be done for the most uh, fastest growing wave number. That's the idea. We look at the wave number, which is the fastest growing because that is what, uh, out of all the disturbances that you can possibly give, this is the wave number which has the fastest growth and therefore it will grow the fastest and it will decide what will happen to the system in long times. So nonlinear evolution means I'll do a full, uh, uh, I look at uh, how the disturbance is going to change in time, even when it is no more very small. So linear stability analysis is where it was being looked at where the perturbations are really small. Nonlinear is where you're allowing the disturbances to grow even much further away. Okay, so here is an example of the really tailored instability, which means the heavy over light configuration. Okay, just to give an example, the competing forces here is gravity, which is trying to push it down, and surface tension, which doesn't want to uh, the interface to deform. Okay, so gravity is fighting surface tension, and if gravity wins, the fluid will topple down. Okay, and if uh, surface tension wins, the fluid will remain as it is. So in the video that I'll show, 
uh, I have a heavy liquid here in a uh, conical section and I'm going to push in lighter fluid. Okay, so from here, you'll see that lighter fluid is getting pu pushed up. Okay, so you can see this video here, the lighter fluid is getting pushed up. So which means uh, the blob of fluid is going up and it remains stable, right? It remains stable. But after a while, you'll see that the fluid topples, right? You can already see that there is a small deformation which is coming up. And so the wider containers uh, eventually uh, make sure that gravity is dominant for uh, when the when the conical when the fluid was lying here when it was below it was stable as it goes further uh, i think i have to yeah now it has toppled so which means as the fluid goes up and up and it reaches more and more wider section gravity wins okay uh, so that is so that sort of tells you the length scale is important in deciding what is uh, the, uh, the factor that wins in the end in the computing fx whether it's uh, surface tension or gravity in this particular case and in extended system so where you have uh, a 2d plane that i'm looking at and this is uh, glycerol uh, which was kept in a petri dish uh, and then you just inverted it okay and because this uh, viscosity of glycerol is very high you can see it for a time before the entire glycerol falls down and you're looking at it from the top view okay so the glycerol is under the uh, plate that you're looking at. And you can see that the drops are of specific uh, radius always. So that length scale is effectively decided by like what I said in the previous graph, this. Okay. So there are several ways in which you can understand what will be pattern formation and uh, how they are useful. So let me come to uh, the talk now. Uh, okay, so it's 720 already. Okay, so, so in today's talk, what we'll be looking at is the electrostatic Faraday instability in thin films. So let me begin with the physics of Faraday instability. So if you have uh, a simple pendulum, uh, you know that uh, it has a natural frequency with which it tries to oscillate. Okay, And in this case, it's, its inertia is very important, the mechanical inertia. For example, if this pendulum were to be kept in a very viscous solution, you will see that it would just come back to its mechanical equilibrium of uh, rest. Okay, So the natural frequency for any system is very much dependent on how much inertia is present. And if you have a natural frequency, you can force such systems to create resonance, okay? So for example, the same pendulum, if I were to move its base at the same frequency as it is moving up, uh, you know, the pendulum is moving, then you'll see that the pendulum goes out of whack. You know, it completely becomes unstable and you can use it to either to your advantage in certain systems uh, or to avoid certain cases. For example, the famous uh, uh, Tacoma bridge collapse was an example of, uh, resonant instability where the entire bridge collapsed because its natural frequency matched with the frequency of the winds that were blowing that time and the bridge collapsed. So in our case, we'll use a resonant mechanism to induce mixing in uh, thin films. Okay, so Faraday waves in fluids uh, will be the case where you have, you take a liquid, it has a natural frequency. For example, uh, I don't know if you can see me, uh, I think my video is still on. So if you take a glass of water and you give a disturbance, you can see that the interface always vibrates at some frequency. So that is the natural frequency with which this fluid wants to be, uh, behave. Uh, so that's the natural frequency of this fluid in this container. So it depends on the length scale, the fluid's properties, densities, its viscosity, its surface tension. And because it has a natural frequency, you can tap it at uh, its natural frequency uh, by electrostatic means in this particular example, and you can induce mixing and Im improve transport. Okay, so we'll look at some examples of electrohydrodynamic instability first. Here, what you're looking at is an example, uh, is an experiment by Schaffer et al, who performed these experiments in 2000, which was published in Nature. And what he's having is a polystyrene film and he's applying electric field. Okay, and he applies electric field. You see that the film starts to bulge up. It comes up. Uh, so what you're seeing here is the top view. What you're seeing here is a side view. So you can see that these pillars are formed of specific length scale separation. And in uh, so these were patterned electrodes. And in unpatterned electrodes, you see this uh, again hexagonally stacked uh, patterns. Uh, so these dark patterns are the pillars. Okay, so it's like a cylindrical pillar in this case. Uh, here is the top view. It's like a cylindrical pillar. And the white portion is the hole uh, as the dip. Okay, again, it's an electrically forced polystyrene film that you're looking at. And here is a simulation which I had done uh, using the reduced order model that I'll be talking about. Okay, and you can see that it a perfectly flat film on application of electric field shows this pillaring uh, very uh, nicely using our reduced order model. 
Okay, so uh, so this these experiments were done for very very thin films of 100 nanometers. That's important to keep in mind. And in such films, inertia is unimportant, and it would behave very much like the uh, creeping uh, uh, the the case of the pendulum in a very viscous fluid that I had looked. Even if you f there is no natural frequency at all, and therefore even if you were to put an AC, you wouldn't see any resonant mixing. So these were around 100 nanometers, the thickness of these polystyrene films that they were looking at. So these this vertical thickness that you're looking at is 100 nanometers. And if you take such 100 nanometer thick film and you even apply electric field, you don't see much. You again see that, uh, so what you're looking at here is the maximum position, maximum uh, height of the film with time. You'll see that it just oscillates and eventually the max, it reaches the pillar mode. Uh, so this is the pillar mode and it just oscillates around that pillaring. Okay, you don't see what uh, should be seen for a inertial system. This is a very, uh, this is the behavior of a creeping flow situation where you have very small, very thin films of 100 nanometers, you have applied electric field and the, the system still shows pillaring mode. You see nice pillars coming up again, just that the peak, it just keeps oscillating about, you know, so the H max is oscillating about some value. That's what you see. So this pillar, it forms a big pillar and then it starts to just oscillate around that equilibrium configuration. Okay. And you can also use uh, patterned electrodes to create uh, designs of uh, importance. So this is another example by Schaffer where he had used patterned electrodes to create uh, required uh, uh, patterns for elect uh, This was for electronic conductors that he had used. In our case, what we'll be looking at is uh, that uh, we'll be looking at uh, mi microfluidic ex experiments where they are not nanometer length scales but a few microns thickness, okay? And in such cases, the fluid inertia becomes important. In ultra thin films, which I had talked about till now, there were a few hundred nanometers thick and inertial effects were unimportant. Whereas for thicker films, inertia becomes important. And because inertia is important, there is a natural frequency for the fluid and we can exploit the natural frequency to induce res resonant response and therefore generate mixing and improve transport in the system. Okay, so this is a paper uh, which was published in 1831 in uh, Proceedings of uh, Royal Society. Uh, which was uh, by uh, Faraday, Michael Faraday. I mean, he's famous for extraordinary amount of things, but in this case, in the appendix of the paper, he had mentioned that uh, fluids, when you apply such periodic disturbances, can show patterns. So what you're looking at is a fluid with uh, chalk powder uh, dispersed on it, and he saw that the chalk powder uh, sort of assumed patterns. Okay, so this is how this field started off. He had originally started on powders with a violin bow, then he, in his appendix, just stated that even fluid sort of behave like how powders would have behaved. And uh, that's how this entire uh, uh, Faraday instability in fluids uh, kicked started. Okay, so here is a few experiments which were done in University of Florida while I was there by uh, Kevin Ward, who was a PhD student there. What we're looking at is two fluids and an interface between them, and they are being uh, oscillated, okay, at different frequencies. And if, depending on different, at different frequencies, and depending on the uh, amplitude of forcing, you can see that the interface can show different patterns. So on the right hand side is the theoretical prediction and on the left hand side is the corresponding experiments and you can see that they match perfectly well. Okay, so this is a mechanically forced system. By that I mean you're taking a liquid and you're moving the liquid up and down. Okay, very similar experiments using electrostatic forcing was also done by Kevin uh, who was doing his PhD there and here you see a thin film uh, of a few centimeters actually and you're applying electric field and you see these patterns again forming so here it is electrically forced whereas here it was mechanically forced in these videos earlier videos okay so what we know till now uh, about we knew when we started all the work was ye had uh, in 1960 already uh, given evidence that inviscid electrostatic uh, faraday he had already looked at where the fluids were inviscid okay and he had shown that such inviscid fluids show uh, resonant behavior, and we can predict uh, uh, such uh, instabilities in inviscid fluids. In 2017, uh, around the time when I was doing my uh, postdoc, uh, Bandupadhyay and Hart also published uh, uh, linear stability results for such a system, by which I mean uh, look, looking at disturbances of very, very small dis uh, amplitude. Okay, And later on, uh, while uh, I was there, Kevin submitted his thesis, who showed that the linear stability threshold uh, for a uh, water uh, dielectric system can be predicted by a perfect conductor, perfect dielectric model. By that, I mean, you can assume the water to be a perfect conductor and air to be a perfect dielectric. And you can see that the experiments and theory match perfectly well. Okay, so 
uh, I mean, there are uh, before that there were uh, arguments about whether a water air system can be considered as a perfect conductor, perfect dielectric system. But uh, with experiments, we showed that it is indeed uh, a right assumption. And then once this was done, then I used uh, what is my modeling strategy to get the nonlinear uh, evolution of such systems. Okay, so I'll come to the inertial lubrication model uh, that I'm going to talk about today. So what I'll uh, so the end uh, so these are the assumptions uh, of the model. So the fundamental assumption is that it's a long wave analysis, which means that the x direction is going to be much larger than the thickness of the film. Okay, so when waves are generated, the waves are much larger in extent compared to the thickness of the film. Momentum is inertia, and that will be retained. We'll develop because there is a length scale separation. We can use boundary layer arguments. So if you have in undergrad, you have uh, heard about the Prandtl's boundary layer uh, technique to find out how the mixing, uh, the heat transfer layer and momentum transport layer is. So where the viscous boundary layer becomes important and things like that. So some similar arguments are put forward here because of separation of length scales. And I'll use a Galerkin weighted residual approach to come with governing equations for the system. In the end, I'll have thin film equations for one and two variables, which is interface position and the flow rate. So these are the two variables that I'll be having, and I'll look at how they evolve in time. Okay, so quickly, I'll just go through the mathematical model. So this is the schematic. We have one liquid here, which is water. It is active, and it is a perfect conductor. And here we have air, which more or less is passive. And we have two electrodes on top and bottom, and we are going to apply an AC field. Okay, and gravity is acting downwards. So the governing equation in fluid one, which is hydrodynamically active, is continuity equation, the Navier-Stokes equation, and Navier-Stokes equation with an additional tensor, which is, uh, okay, so in this case, there is no tensor. So this is the Navier-Stokes uh, equation. So, uh, and for the electrostatics, we have the uh, Gauss's law in the passive load. So the, this guy is perfect conductor. So whatever potential you apply here is the potential all over the conducting fluid, and therefore at the interface, Whereas here, it's a dielectric. It doesn't conduct uh, electricity at all. It's air. And therefore, it's a poor conductor. And therefore, we use the Gauss's law, which is del square phi equal to 0, because there is no charge inside. Uh, uh, we get del square phi equal to 0, subject to the conditions that the top electrode is grounded and the bottom uh, at the interface. We have the same potential, which is being applied at the wall. Okay, And we use uh, scaling. Uh, so in x direction, we'll use lambda, which is much larger than in the z. z, we'll use the thickness of the film h. OK, and the x direction, we'll use lambda. And the assumption holds that h by lambda is very, very small. OK, and then these are the velocity scales for the two fluids. And this comes from standard lubrication scaling. And uh, once you use all the scalings, you'll get the non the governing equation to be continuity equation, which in two dimension looks like this, which is a very familiar equation in the Z direction, the momentum equation comes out to be of this form. So where the pressure in the Z direction is just given by gravity. Okay, it's a non-dimensional gravity where gravity is given here. And the X direction, the momentum in the X direction, we retain the inertia, okay? And it gives, these are the uh, con convective terms, and this is the transient term. And the pressure gradient in X is balanced by the leading order viscous term. Okay, so this comes from the Navier-Stokes equation. And we have the uh, potential which can be solved. For example, this equation, del square phi 2 equal to 0. Once you put the two boundary conditions, you'll directly get phi 1 and phi 2 to be this. Phi 1 is anyway what is there at the wall. Phi 2 is solved using the Gauss's law. So we know phi 1 and phi 2, and uh, we know all these equations. At the, the boundary conditions that you use to solve them are the no slip and no penetration conditions. The kinematic condition effectively is the mass conservation equation, which tells you that no fluid goes into the other phase. Like, you know, there is no mass transferring across the interface because it's a perfectly uh, uh, immiscible system. Like uh, there is no uh, water vapor in this uh, system is the assumption. There is no evaporation happening is the assumption. We are assuming that the air is purely air and water remains. Whatever water you had put in into the system remains in the water phase. And at the interface, you have the stress balance, which is, so this is the tangential stress, which is zero. That gives you du dz equal to zero in the long wave scaling. And you have the uh, normal stress balance. So this is n dot t dot n, where t is the stress tensor. Uh, n dot t dot n is the normal stress acting at the interface. And this is the normal Maxwell stress, where Maxwell stress depends on the electric field. Because there is an electric field gradient, uh, right, in this. Uh, there is a finite electric field. 
uh, that field contributes to extra stress at the interface. So that is given by this M2. So we have tangential stress. Uh, we have the normal uh, Cauchy stress tensor, which is because of velocity gradients. We have the Maxwell stress because of the electric field. And we have the, uh, the curvature term, which is gamma times del dot n, which is sort of like the Young-Laplace equation. So if there is uh, curvature, there is a pressure difference between the two. So that is this term. So that effectively gives you this uh, in, the no in the final form. So this is a scale form of this equation. Okay, so we had no slip, no penetration. We had kinematic condition and the interface stress balance. And you push everything into it. And when you solve it, you finally get two equations. One for H, dH, dt, depending on dq, dx, where q is my flow rate. Okay, so q is defined as the flow rate uh, integral of u. So that's my flow rate. So dH, dt plus dq, dx is zero is one equation. Similarly, you have another equation for dq, dt. So you have two variables and uh, two equations, and therefore it's a closed system, and you can solve it uh, using uh, any, uh, so for example, method of lines you can use for, as a finite difference, or you can use spectral methods. Uh, in, in my case, I had used spectral methods, but it's a standard PD, which can be solved in MATLAB. Okay, and the important nonlinear, uh, uh, non-dimensional parameters are the electric field capillary uh, number, the Ren uh, Reynolds number, the gravity non-dimensional, and beta, which is a fluid holdup. Okay, so these are the important non-dimensional numbers that come up in this governing equation. Okay, so I'll come to the key results. Uh, I think I have another 10 minutes. Okay, so I'll come to the key results. So first, I'll uh, I'll talk about the linear stability results, which is to look at this equation and see what happens in the case of very small disturbances. Okay, so if you have very small disturbances, you can equation about a base state. So my base state, uh, which I'm looking at, is a perfectly flat film with no flow. Okay, so I took a perfectly flat film with no flow, and I'm applying electric field. After some uh, amount of uh, electric field, for example, if you keep increasing the voltage, you'll see that the system can become unstable. For very small voltage, you'll see that the interface remains perfectly flat. There is no reason for it to deform. But for a sufficiently strong electric field, you'll see that it becomes unstable. Okay, so I'm going to look at very small disturbances in the presence of that electric field. Okay, so that gives you what is known as the damped Mach equation. So you'll get a single equation. Uh, once you linearize, you'll get this equation where d squared h by dt squared plus this factor, which is zeta, is the uh, damping, which goes proportional to dh dt. And you have this term and h. Okay, so the Mach equation is something which is also seen in the case of the pendulum that I had shown in the first case. So you have pendulum and you force it, you'll see that you'll get a, a math equation in that case also. So this effectively tells you that whatever happens for that pendulum, a mechanical system, pretty much all physics happens even in this case of a very thin film, okay? And what you see omega naught here is the natural frequency, okay? So this equation, because it's of Matthew form, we can right away identify what the uh, natural frequency is. So the natural frequency comes out to be dependent on the gravity, dependent on the amount of surface tension and the presence of the field. Okay, And this part here is the forcing that you're giving. So delta is the measure of forcing. Omega naught is the natural frequency. And this guy here is the damping, amount of viscosity present in the system. Okay, So this gives you the Matthew equation. And uh, here is the mechanical. So in the absence of electric field, this is what you have, a mechanical natural frequency. In the presence of electrostatic field, you have two of them competing and you get a total natural frequency. So what I'm plotting here is uh, A versus wave number. Like I said, I look at different Fourier modes and I'll find out A, which is the critical value at which the instability is seen. So the dashed line here is what happened in the absence of inertia. Remember the pillars that I had talked about in the first part, that is what is predicted by the straight line. Uh, and this is a very thin film, 0.25 mm. If you come to 0.75 mm, you'll see that the pillaring mode, which is the dashed line, is above these uh, these tongues, which is the uh, inertial Faraday tongues. Okay, so this is what is uh, this is what you get when you have Faraday instability in the system. You get these tongues. Okay, so everything on top uh, is uh, unstable. Everything below is stable. Okay, so that's how you should understand. So if I operate at this voltage, I mean this is non-dimensional. If you operate at this amplitude of potential for this wave number, then you'll see that you'll see instability. But if you are somewhere here, you'll see that it can remain perfectly flat. So what you're seeing here is that uh, a, a thicker film of 0.75 mm becomes unstable to the Faraday kind of an instability, not really to the pillaring, because the threshold for pillaring is much above 
the uh, threshold for this uh, faraday okay so as you keep small uh, keeps uh, increasing the amplitude ever so slightly you will see that first you will see that the system becomes unstable to faraday instability and not really pillaring so thicker films become unstable to uh, faraday instability okay and that is what we show here so we take this triangle here and we do a nonlinear simulation for this amplitude and this wave number you see that in the absence of inertia it was supposed to just pillar up but you see that in the presence of inertia you'll see that all these guys which are unstable they contribute and the system effectively reaches a steady faraday resonance system you can see that it's purely uh, resonance uh, periodic response that you're seeing and sh and h are subharmonic and harmonic responses subharmonic means it it oscillates at half the frequency of the forcing frequency and harmonic means it oscillates at the same frequency as your forcing okay so here i am showing you a uh, uh, sh and h like you know the subharmonic and harmonic responses yeah so here you can see that uh, this response and this response are uh, integer multiple by 2 so here it oscillates twice whereas it oscillates only once so this is subharmonic faraday instability whereas this is harmonic so all i have done is i have chosen different uh, dimension for the container that i have kept so the fluid is same uh, and at the amplitude is chosen corresponding to the threshold so the subharmonic becomes unstable right away at somewhere close to 5 point something and harmonic becomes somewhere around this so you can use this to create mixing in the system so these are very thin films remember these are microfluidic systems uh, 0.75 mm that i had seen, which is 750 microns uh, and uh, in such systems uh, the flow is usually the flow is laminar and electrostatic forcing can be used to create mixing so here i am plotting the uh the the maximum of the interface h not as as a function of time uh the solid line is the non linear result and the dashed line is the mathieu equation that i had shown in the linear stability results so for very small times when the disturbance is small you can see that the non linear and the linear response is the same because linear response is valid only for as long as the disturbances remain small for very large disturbances you have to do a non linear simulation to see what happens this linear results are not valid anymore so the, the solid line is the actual system's behavior okay so i'll just skip this and i'll show you what happens if you had a very uh, steady forcing a constant dc forcing uh, you can see that in the case of a steady dc forcing the system pillars up and eventually it shows what is known as a sliding so this configuration becomes further unstable and it starts to slide okay so this sort of a behavior has been seen in rayleigh taylor system remember the first system that i had shown when the fluid uh, so you should ima imagine the rayleigh taylor system with the gravity pointing upward so the fluid is trying to fall up like that and as it falls a part of the film which is trying is clinging to the surface makes it drain around so sometimes you might have seen water droplets sliding along bars right a uh, window so such are uh, such effects are sliding effects which is a secondary instability of the symmetric solution and you can see that such a uh, very similar thing to rayleigh taylor instability happens in an electrostatic forcing also okay <clears throat> uh i'll quickly come about uh, talking about the yeah i'll just take 2 minutes uh, so this is a heavy overlight configuration as of now we had looked at a stable film and we were looking, looking at what happens in the presence of electric field so here is a case where you have a mechanical forcing so the the vertical dashed line everything on the left is really taylor unstable everything on the right is really taylor stable which means the system would have uh, uh, fallen if you were here okay and system would not have fallen if you are in this case for a really taylor and if you were to take a thin film and you shake it mechanically people have shown that uh, uh, this comes to the left which means you can sort of stabilize so if you shake strongly you can what was really taylor unstable at zero forcing it was really taylor unstable you can see that it becomes stable because everything on the right was stable you can see that this vertical straight line in the presence of shaking comes to the left and therefore it stabilizes okay whereas here you see that electrostatic forcing the 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 dashed line doesn't go left it goes right which makes it just makes it more unstable so the mechanical forcing and electrostatic forcing are analogous to each other in several sense but not always in this case it always destabilizes and uh, this is a system where you have again an unstable so the film is up it is heavy and you see that it just remains unstable and it will eventually slide 
in this fashion. Like it just does an oscillatory sliding. You can see that it's sliding, but in an oscillatory manner. And we called it the earthworm-like motion, uh, which happens in the presence of electric field, which is oscillatory. OK, so I'll quickly summarize my results. Uh, so these are the uh, <coughs> results. So we used a WRIBL model, which is a very simplistic model uh, using certain approximations to capture the Faraday instability in thin films. The typical response uh, is the same frequency as forcing frequency because of the uh, fact that uh, it is coming as the uh, harmonic response. You, you had seen that the harmonic response is the most unstable, like in the tongue. And it can be used to uh, enhance mixing in an otherwise low inertial laminar system. And electrostatic suppression of RT instability is not possible. So Rayleigh Taylor unstable is a heavy overlight. If you apply electric field, you cannot stabilize it. You can only further destabilize. And you'll see an earthworm-like motion in that case. And for more details, I mean, you can refer to these papers which have been published. Uh, uh, yeah, so we have applied recently similar arguments for a very small drop and uh, using electro betting. So there's a drop. You can change its contact angle by using a, an electric field. So this is something which we are working right now. And it's used in microfluidic cases where you have droplet microfluidics and you want to enhance mixing. You can apply electric field there as well. OK, so uh, I'll stop now, and I can take questions. And uh, meanwhile, I can also talk. Uh, I mean, if there are any questions, uh, you can ask right now. And then I'll talk a few about a higher, higher uh, education opportunities at IIT Kanpur. Uh, Thank you, I sir. Think, uh, uh, yeah, just uh, Dr. Dhrikin, I think you can also finish the higher education, because I think uh, that will kindle more uh, questions. Ah, OK, sure. sure yeah. Together, you mm -hmm. can take the questions. Uh, at OK, the sure. OK, yeah. OK, fine. Okay. So yeah, I'll uh, quickly talk about uh, why to pursue higher studies at IITK. So we have an excellent uh, placement record, both in academia and industry. You'll see that a lot of alumni are placed in several IITs as faculty, and also uh, several of the industries too. And we have a thoroughly revised uh, uh, curriculum, which is uh, you know aimed at academic excellence. And we have outstanding research facilities. And uh, importantly, there are several uh, uh, incubating uh, of companies that have happened in recent times. And uh, also along with that, uh, there is several funding which is present for students to present their work at international conferences, which boosts up their uh, confidence uh, and uh, pursue probably academic uh, profile or even to pursue R&D, you know, a core position in R&D sector. So right now we have 23 faculty uh, in the department uh, with uh, Professor Ashutosh Sharma also, uh, uh, who is right now the DSC secretary. Uh, so he's on duty right now, but he'll be back probably next year on, on campus. And we have 12 professors, three associate professors, and eight assistant professors, and uh, quite competent staffs also uh, to help students in their experiments and uh, research. So that's the typical strength right now uh, in the department. We are around 300 students in BTEC, 47 MTEC, and dual degree. So dual degree is pretty much coming through J. Uh, and uh, MTech students are admitted through GATE. The qualification for GATE uh, for uh, uh, admission is to have 55% marks in your B plus GATE. And there's also something which is MS by research. MTech is purely course-based and the final year project. MS is heavily research-based, where you have to submit a thesis. And uh, you your thesis will be evaluated uh, out of the institute, it goes for review and comes back pretty much like a PhD thesis. Uh, uh, so it's research based, the MS by research, which is what I had joined in IIT Madras actually, and then I converted it to PhD. So, uh, and we have PhD, the usual PhD degree that is offered. And uh, <clears throat> the admissions for MTech happen in May. Uh, MS also happens along with MTech in May. And it's research thesis based. Uh, PhD admission we have twice a year, May and December, both the time we offer uh, admissions. And uh, there is also a walk in uh, interview which is conducted typically in May. Uh, apart from the usual uh, post advertisements that we post, we also uh, allow people to come on campus and uh, have a walk in interview in case you missed the uh, usual deadlines for uh, applications. So keep looking for the posting for both uh, usual admissions and the walk-in interview. Uh, even for PhD, the, uh, the requirement is to have 55% uh, in your master's. Uh, the, then these are some of the interesting 
facilities that you have on campus once you join. There are six PG and two, uh, six boys and two uh, girls hostels. There's an SBRA, which is a single bedroom apartment for married students in case uh, you have spouse who wants to join you. There are specifically constructed apartments for them and very good uh, mess and uh, internet facilities. And the standard, uh, uh, I think I'm down on time. There's a good CCD, which is where I spend most of my time. And uh, actually, for sports activities, it's an extraordinary place. So there, I've not seen uh, probably any IIT which has as good sports facilities as IIT Kanpur. I was a sports buff during my uh, college days. And now I'm in the faculty team also. So, so for people interested in sports, they should definitely come here. And of course, academics is the most important. Yeah, and for more information, you can always mail me at the finesp at ITK. And you can also look at the website. And uh, right now, I'm the I'm a part of the DPGC committee, which is the Department Postgraduate Committee. So, with respect to uh, anything, you can contact me as well. And the convener for DPGC is uh, Navin Tiwari. You can contact Dr. Navin Tiwari as well. Yeah. So that's it. Uh, you can ask me any questions. Should I stop? Thank there? you, sir, for yeah. your valuable speech. If there are any questions, you can ask by unmuting your mic or you can also text in chat box. So we have some questions in our chat box. Okay, so I have to stop sharing to see it. Okay. Where, where is the chat? Uh, uh, in the chat the box, Google, sir. Google, Google otherwise, meeting. Uh, okay, can you read it? Oh, okay, there it is, chat window. Okay, huh? Yeah. Oh, wow, okay, so many questions. Okay, well, so the first question is, sir, can you explain why the inertial effects become uh, unimportant in nanoscale while the while it's acceptable in microscale? Okay, so the answer to that comes up uh, in terms of looking at the Reynolds number. So if you look at Reynolds numbers, uh, it comes as rho u d by mu, where d or uh, typically d is the, taken as the length scale in the system. So as you have larger length scales, the inertia becomes important. You can see that very, very small systems, uh, it's viscosity, which is important, and not really the inertia. That comes by scaling it. You can see that the viscous forces are dominant at very small length scales. Uh, that's the entire idea of boundary layer also. Like, for example, if you have a fluid and you keep increase, uh, like if you have a particle, like a solid particle, and you keep increasing the flow rate around it, the drag is effectively felt by that small region, which is called as the boundary layer. So the F idea being that as you decrease length scales, or basically in that small length scale is where your uh, uh, visco viscous effects are important, and inertia typically is unimportant in small length scales. So that's how it comes up by looking at, you look at the two forces and you find out what is the non-dimensional number, you'll see that inertia is lesser and lesser important as you decrease the length scale. I hope uh, that's clear to Logeshwari and uh, so okay so next question is akila uh, this is okay and uh, could you please emphasize the need to enhance transport in microfluidics okay so the answer again remains the same uh, when you have uh, when you have usual microfluidic systems the reynolds number is not more than 10 uh, that's the usual reynolds number that you're looking at in such cases uh, the, as you know the the stable solution uh, in the channel flow uh, is mostly laminar, which is the parabolic uh, fossil flow that we understand in fluid flow. You must have, you're a final year student, so you must be knowing about the Hagen Poisson flow. So that's the flow which comes up at very small Reynolds number. Those are the solution, even at very large Reynolds number, but they become unstable and you see turbulence. So typically you need very large Reynolds number to see turbulence. So in microfluidics, the system remains uh, laminar, and in laminar scales, the mixing across fluid layers is very much dependent on diffusion. So you don't have enough mixing happening because you are solely dependent on diffusion and diffusion you know is very time consuming. You have to wait for long times. So it's always advantageous to sort of intervene and do something to improve mixing. In this talk, we were talking about electric field to do that. And there are other ways also. You can change channel geometries and other, other things also magnetic particles you can put and apply magnetic fields but essentially that's the reason why you improve uh, why, why you are wanting to improve transport 
A basic question: How to know about a number of stable states in a system? Uh, it's uh, it's actually uh, not very evident because uh, for very simple systems like a quadratic polynomial, etc., you can know the stable system by looking at the degree of the nonlinearity. For example, x dot equals x minus x squared plus x cubed plus x to the power four. Then you know that when x dot is zero, it's a quadratic equation. It has four solutions. But for nonlinear systems which are spatially dependent, it's not very uh, a priori known how many nonlinear uh, uh, because of its nonlinearity how many solutions are there. It's just actually very difficult to a priori predict. What you can predict is if you know some solutions. Uh, in, in, uh, so the evidence comes from experiments. You do experiments and you see some of the solutions. So then you know that okay, there is a solution which is in the neighborhood of this a mathematical solution and that's how you proceed. So because liquid jet breaking into a drop has been seen, so we know that that's the solution. And non-linearly also, if you do a simulation, CFD simulation, you can get there. But uh, if you you cannot say that that is the only solution, you might have to explore the parameters to say or see if there are more solutions. Actually, uh, so one of the things that I skipped in my presentation was that because I talked about one state and I talked about the uh, Faraday state. There is actually in between, so that's the slide that I skipped. There was one more state which we accidentally hit upon. We didn't, we couldn't predict that it was there. So it's very difficult to a priori predict it. Okay, then uh, finally, finally, here does the MS by research admire admit admission require? Yeah, yeah, the MS by research admission is the same criteria as I mean, you have to clear 55% uh, marks. And uh, gate, that's the thing. Uh, for the investigation of chemical extraction, could you please suggest the important requirements to perform? I have not understood the question. Uh, for the investigation of chemical extraction, could you please suggest the important requirements to perform under microfluidic system? Uh, Ranga Bhashim, can you please, Dr. Ranga Bhashim, can you please explain what you meant? This is just to undertake. Uh, hello. Yes, yes, I can hear you. Yeah. Hello. Yeah. Uh, this is just to emphasize, like, uh, for a BTEC level uh, research, uh, how to understand the extraction system. For example, if you have some two chemicals and then to extract a particular chemicals, like, uh -huh. how about the designing aspect of a channels, the pattern of flow, okay. that could emphasize in the direction for the students. Okay. So you're uh, talking about uh, two phase systems. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah, so uh, I mean, there has there has been a significant amount of work uh, uh, since the field of uh, microfluidics had started on using microfluidic systems to uh, carry out uh, extraction between two phases. So the idea being that you have micro channel, you push in two fluids, and you want to extract one uh, component from one phase to the other. And one of the advantages of microfluidic system is that it gives you very high surface area per unit volume compared to macroscopic systems because surface area per unit volume goes as one by L because surface area is L square, volume is L cube. So L square by L cube gives you one by L. So that itself tells you that as you make the system smaller and smaller, the surface area per unit volume is large. And uh, one usual way is to rely on diffusion. Like generally people have just passed them and depending on the amount of holdup and that depends on the viscosity ratio of the fluid, how much holdup you give. Uh, it, it actually doesn't depend directly on the flow rate. So you can give flow rate, the viscosity ratio eventually decides how much of the channel is occupied by one guy and the other, uh, along with the wettability. And then the fluid gets transported across solely based on diffusion. That were the preliminary ex 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 uh, experiments done. Recently, electric field have been used to create interfacial waves. Uh, there have been magnetic uh, uh, effects also used to create. So the more uh, you know distortion you give, there is more surface area and more uh, transport happening. There are also ways by which you can change the ge geometry instead of just looking at a rectangular cha channel, which goes uh, straight. You can look at uh, serpentine channels. So because there is some finite inertia, like R is order of 10, as you go around the turns, you see what's known as Dean vortices, like because of centrifugal force, you see the fluid goes as helical 
helically and that creates additional mixing so so uh, so the question was how you can improve how can how can i suggest to him yeah to, uh, to basically yeah so these are the different ways you can improve transport but the basic idea is the transport is dependent on the uh, partition coefficient you can you can improve the partition coefficient by choosing the exactly very nice system which uh, just because of the fact that the partition coefficient is so large that the fluid the component gets transported into across the other thing so that's one thing but very often you don't get that nice you know guy to take away the component so you have to rely on more and more things to improve the mixing so these are several ways you can go about doing it so the residence time is very important the choice of solvent and uh, the i think i forgot the name of the thing it's called the guy extracting liquid is called something uh, so that the choice of that the uh, the geometry you can make it serpentine you can actually make it 3d also sometimes people have also looked at 3d to create chaotic uh, advection so you you the fluid is pushed but it's in a 3d like and it goes around in a 3d it's not just serpentine it goes around 3d also so there are there are a lot of research happening in improving and recently it's also been done in uh, not continuous systems but droplet microfluidics where you take one droplet a basically array of droplet like instead of pumping liquids you take one droplet uh, array like one droplet and apply electric field magnetic field and temperature for example because of convection inside the drop so those effects are also being taken uh, being looked at okay thank you thank you so uh, So the gate score actually it depends on the performance of the of the year actually so it the gate uh, uh, and also it depends on uh, several factors actually it just uh, it, it depends on year by year so there is no a priori that we decide it depends on a lot of factors yeah i am tech so also there was a side slide where you showed theoretical prediction of stable shapes and then experimental real cells exactly match how are the shapes theoretic predicted ah so the theoretic prediction comes from linear stability analysis that i had talked about and then looking at what is known as the eigen function i didn't go into the detail but exactly what i did also gives you the information like i just showed you parts of the results where i told about looking at a system and finding out the disturbance so when i say that uh, this disturbance grows the most so i can find out what is that disturbance how does it look in the two dimensional surface so so the two dimensional form looks like that so that comes from linear stability analysis so that's how it is theoretically predicted it's it's little mathematically involved to explain right away but it's looking at a linear system ax equal to b ax equal to lambda b and looking at how the x looks like so lambda tells you the uh, eigen value which is the growth rate and things like that x tells you the corresponding fastest growing function uh, so ax equal to lambda bx kind of a problem is solved and the solution tells you the answer okay so uh, is it uh, possible to induce electrostatically forced peaks for non magnetic materials if not uh, no uh, actually yeah you can you don't need uh, uh, I, i don't know what you meant by non magnetic so right now air and water are pretty much non magnetic in that sense so it can be used uh, for non magnetic so there are different kinds of uh, electrically conducting materials you can use dielectric dielectric which means poor conductor poor conductor you can use uh, uh, like extremely by poor i mean very bad conductor very bad conductor that's perfect dielectric perfect dielectric in our case we looked at a perfect conductor and a perfect dielectric which is good enough for water air system uh, but we have also looked at leaky dielectric systems wherein there is some charges in the system so it's not exactly very bad conductor neither is it very good conductor it's in between so all of them you can see uh, such uh, cases so between a bad conductor and a good conductor between bad and bad uh, for example the paper by shafer the nature paper that i talked about it was a polymer which is not a good conductor it was a perfect dielectric on top you had air which is also perfect dielectric the fact that there is a difference in permittivity constant of the systems is good enough to create a stress and create this patterns i hope that explains then i think the last question is 
uh, we saw how resonance is resonant thin liquid films electrocyclic and we were able to see its appearance in real life so is this application linked to electromagnetism as in like any example Electro so right now there is no electromagnetism uh, magnetic part is decoupled uh, because of the time scales involved uh, it is purely electrostatics that we had used the governing equation never had any the d dt is not so much important to create a magnetic field so there is a time scale which is there which relates electric changes to magnetic fields present so not always you need to have uh, the, uh, uh, there is something which is negligible like the magnetic effect is there it is non zero but it is negligible so right now it's not electromagnetic it is electrostatic uh, equations that we had used and the assumption is very valid for the time scales that we are looking at the electromagnetic field change and things like that okay so i think i've answered the few questions so this uh, is there a chance for direct phd after btech yes there is a chance for direct phd as well so you can get uh, you can apply for uh, direct phd uh, you need 7.5 gpa and then you have to go through the usual process of phd interview there's a written test there's an interview and gate yeah yeah you can do that if there are some more questions you can ask by unmuting your microphones let's wait for a couple more minutes okay yeah yeah so that's uh, you can unmute uh, yeah 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 so it's audible right yes i can hear you yes. yeah so uh, thanks uh, dipin for your interesting talk um i have a, a few questions the first one is um to so these uh, the fluids which you're considering uh, may possess some charge and and the, and and for example the counter ions uh, which is uh, surrounding uh, the fluid might uh, attract uh, on the surface or interface and and uh, if there is a chance or possibility for uh, dubai layers to form electric dubai layers uh, so did you yes. actually consider uh, these uh, like like implementing uh, this into your model uh, like do you think it is important Uh, it is i mean it depends on the system that you're looking at for uh, what you said is very much true for systems which can hold charges so yeah. so you are looking at yeah. systems that hold charge right uh, or maybe i missed your no. talk in between no I, I, i in this talk i had looked at a pure conductor which okay uh, which doesn't develop charges it, it, the potential just remains uniform everywhere mm -hmm. and uh, there is just a potential gradient across the pure perfect dielectric there also there are no charges but in the in the two references that i mentioned the second paper which we had published is including charges then you have to look at the accumulation of charges at the interface so the interface will have some finite charge coverage which becomes little involved but the physics remains more or less same you won't get very simple equations like i showed the math yeah. equation yeah. you will get more involved equations actually you don't even get a math equation you get a third order derivative in h which is Uh, which uh, uh, we have looked at actually but i didn't present today but what you're saying is correct uh, in such system okay. charges become important okay and and um, and and for such cases um, so so basically you, you you're focusing on momentum transport right you you mentioned transport in many places is it mainly on momentum transport yes it's mo mostly on momentum coupled with mass right now i have not looked at putting mass objective is to improve mass transfer yes Okay, okay. Using okay. mixing, yeah, using forcing okay. mixing in in microfluidic systems and microgravitation systems. Okay, and and one more question. Um, I saw your your videos as well. Uh, looks like they are periodic domains, aren't they? Yes. Uh, so the linear stability, I had looked at the most unstable wave number. So that's assuming that I'm looking at one uh, period of the most unstable wave. Okay. Okay. Uh, and sorry, one more question as well. Uh, so, in the in the beginning, you just started off with uh, showing um, uh, an example of glycerol. Like when you flip it, uh, it forms uh, like uh, circular rolls uh, in 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 certain pattern. Uh, so, and you mentioned that the the interface or the um, the the stability is based on the length scales of the interface. So, uh, is the is that the the length scale which is forming the rolls or it's the gap between the rolls that's the size stability between the, uh, so, so it's the gap between them but uh, once you do a nonlinear 
analysis with that mm. gap spacing you will get the drop size accurately predicted as well so the linear stability tells you the periodicity in the system yeah only it doesn't tell you what the non linear state would look like so i have no clue whether it would have formed a drop in the first place i only know that a, a wave of this form would grow the most what it would do has to be done non linearly and if you take that most unstable system a mode which comes from linear stability and do a li- non linear simulation like what i did or probably even more involved <coughs> cfd you will yeah. get the top is predicted correctly yeah okay all right yeah thanks thanks very much okay thank you now i call again ms aishwarya to propose the vote of thanks i request aishwarya to take over in this auspicious occasion of dasara iisach chapter of shastra started the learning beyond graduation and we are immensely glad to start this from dr dipin s pillai uh what an insightful talk sir your words have helped us expand our knowledge and helped us understand such complex topics with ease thank you sir i'd also like to take this opportunity to thank our dean dr k s rajan associate dean dr v ponisamy for providing for providing us this opportunity to learn and our uh, faculty members dr p r narain and dr s rangabhasham also our uh, alumni members including shweta shridhar sudarshan shri and srinivasan of batch 2014 and shrika and mohan raj of batch 2019 for gracing this occasion with their presence and all the other students who made this event a great success thank you very much yeah thank you thank all of you uh, for joining and uh, thanks to the coordinators and thanks to dr narin also for inviting me yeah thank you thanks thank, thanks thank you yeah we have come to the end of the session let's end this with a quote every ending is a beginning we just don't know it at the time thank you all from the bottom of my heart now the recording of this session will be stopped